Good morning and welcome. Uh, can I welcome everyone to the PP PPC meeting? And uh, could I ask everyone to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system? Uh, we have re received apologies from David Torrance. Uh, agenda item number one is the consideration of a current petition. Uh, the first item is an evidence session with the Scottish Government and Historic Scotland as part of the committee's consideration of petition PE1523 by Jess Smith on giving the Tinker's Heart of Fergile back to the travelling people. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. And may I welcome Fiona Hislop, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs, and Noel Foyut. Uh, Head of Historic Environment Legislation, Scottish Government, and Barbara Cummins, uh, Director of Heritage Management, Historic Scotland, to the meeting. And can I also welcome uh, Mike Russell, MSP, to the meeting, who has a constituency interest in this petition. I now invite the Cabinet Secretary and then Ms Cummins to make a brief opening statement, from which we will then move to questions. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. I'd like to just say a few words to set the scene before handing over to Historic Scotland to talk about the details of this case. The contribution of the traveller community to Scotland's life and culture deserves to be valued and appreciated as a whole. It represents an important and often neglected strand in Scotland's story. The traveller's lifestyle is to move lightly through the land, which leaves little by way of physical traces. And that is why I, I think we all agree the Tinker's Heart is so significant. It represents a rare, tangible monument to that community's long presence in Scotland's landscape. This petition uh, asks ministers to direct uh, Historic Scotland to investigate what actions can be taken to ensure the restoration and preservation uh, of the Tinker's Heart. I'd like to talk briefly about when ministers should intervene and when they should not. With the strong support of all parties, we have firmly established the principle that our national collections and other bodies which make curatorial decisions should make those decisions free from ministerial inter interference, that is, free from ministerial direction. With the support and encouragement of MSPs of all parties, we have applied this same principle to Creative Scotland and also in the bill to create the new body Historic Environment Scotland, which Parliament itself approved on November the 4th last year. Um, uh, that principle was also uh, recognised. Neil Bibby, MSP, and Liz Smith, uh, MSP in particular, were keen to test uh, Historic Environment Scotland Bill in respect of minister, Minister's powers of direction. Uh, all members were entirely agreed that it is not the job of ministers to direct what should be scheduled or collected or grant aided. Those are matters for expert judgment, operated against established operational criteria, criteria set out in this case in the Scottish Historic uh, Environment Policy, which have been developed through public consultation. It has been suggested that the Tinker's Heart should be scheduled. It is important to remember that scheduling is intended for a very specific purpose. It is a means of recognising nationally important sites with a view to protecting them against deliberate damage. Scheduling is an end in itself. Uh, convener, I think it's important to point out that scheduling does not change ownership, neither does it bring added public rights of access, nor in itself does it automatically bring restoration and preservation as request, requested in the, uh, this petition. This petition uh, seeks action. Action to restore or preserve our heritage does not depend on scheduling. Public and charitable resources, including funds, are available to support communities who wish to care for and provide access to important monuments. But these can only be mobilised with the agreement of the owners of the sites. Historic Scotland can do much, uh, but it can't compel local cooperation. Uh, with your permission, Convener, I'd like to uh, hand over now to Barbara Cummins, the Director of Heritage Management at Historic Scotland, to outline what has been done and what further action is in hand. Barbara. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you, Committee, for inviting me to attend today. I welcome the opportunity to explain our position. Historic Scotland recognises that the Tinker's Heart is of significant cultural heritage interest. We have been positive and supportive since the case was brought to our attention in 2012, for example, ensuring it is properly recorded, attending local meetings, and involving Archaeology Scotland's Adopt a Monument scheme, which we part fund. The petition calls for preservation and restoration of the heart with the implication that it should be laid out in good order for visitors as a physical reminder of the important contribution of the traveller community to the history of Scotland. We would be supportive of such an initiative. However, there is little that Historic Scotland can do to change the current situation. 
We have been called upon to schedule the site, but that would not achieve the aims of the petition. These could only be achieved by constructive dialogue and the site's owner and the local community's cooperation. The chair of the local group, Here We Are, says the community is well aware that the heart is a special site, but they and the owner want it preserved as it is. The new fence they have installed means that the heart is now protected from cattle damage, which was previously a concern. Historic Scotland can and does encourage cooperation, but as the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary has said, we cannot enforce it. Turning specifically to the question of scheduling, there are over 300,000 recorded monuments in Scotland, of which only about 3 to 5 per cent are actually scheduled, depending on what part of Scotland you're in. We take very seriously the strength of concern about our decision not to schedule the heart, also reflected in this committee's strong interest. And we are very aware that this monument is associated with and especially important to a marginalised and underrepresented group in Scottish society. Many monuments do not meet the criteria for scheduling, but few monuments, if any, have challenged us as this one has. Just before Christmas, John Finney MSP asked several questions in Parliament about equalities issues and specifically whether an equalities impact assessment should have been undertaken when assessing the Tinker's Heart for scheduling. In view of the exceptional circumstances pertaining in this case, we now consider that an equalities impact assessment of the Tinker's Heart decision should have been undertaken. Equalities impact assessments should, be carried out, should not be carried out retrospectively, so we have decided to set aside our earlier decision and start again with a fresh team. I cannot prejudge the outcome of the reassessment, and it is important not to raise expectations, but I believe this is the right way forward. We will inform all those with an interest in the site of our intention to revisit the case. I would be happy to report back to the committee on progress in this work. We expect the scheduling reassessment to take around three to six months, so I would be in a position to provide an update on progress in June 2015. I hope you will agree that this course of action responds to at least some of the concerns of the public and this committee. We remain ready to help in whatever way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to questions. And, uh, you did say in your introduction there, uh, Ms Commons, that uh, you Historic Scotland does acknowledge that uh, Tinker's Heart is a cultural her uh, does have cultural heritage significance. However, uh, it doesn't meet the current criteria for, ske for, for a scheduled monument. Uh, can you then maybe advise what types of sites in uh, ancient monuments and archaeological areas Act 1979 designed to recognise and protect, and what is the practical effect of, list of a listing monument? Um, I, it's correct that when, when we assessed the Tinker's Heart, we didn't consider it met the criteria for scheduling, but we will be looking at that again. So um, that may continue to be our conclusion, but we may come to a different, uh, a different uh, conclusion in that respect. Um, generally, the effect of, of scheduling and the Act is, is simply to recognise monuments of national importance. The legislation does not set out what that means. That's set out in Scottish Historic Environment Policy, which sets the criteria under which we assess scheduling. Um, one of those, the characteristics uh, that a monument can have is the associative characteristics, and clearly that's one of the very strong elements in relation to the Tinker's Heart, and that's one area we'll be looking at very closely again as to whether or not that has been applied correctly, um, in particular taking account of uh, the Equalities Impact Assessment that we'll undertake in parallel with this and whether or not we're adding sufficient weight to those associative characteristics in this instance. The... Uh the guidance, to me, seems rather kind of complex, and, and uh, you know, as the guidance has to distinguish between associations, uh, contextual and intrinsic value, uh, how do these concepts help us to identify and recognise sites uh, of national importance, and why does the guidance ascribe a higher value to intrinsic qualities over others? You, I, I, I suppose, in, in, in terms of intrinsic, you have to have a, a, a there has to be a physical thing, an, an item to consider, um, to, to schedule it as a monument. So um, I suppose that's the, the first thing. Can you identify uh, a site, a structure, um, a, a piece of evidence of man's intervention? So that's where the, that primary concern of the intrinsic uh, value com, comes in. Are we uh, applying that too strongly to the detriment of the other characteristics in this instance? That's a question that we will revisit 
um, uh, given the, the, the interest uh, that has been shown and the fact that we, we need to consider whether or not we're ascribing too high a value to one characteristic or, of the scheduling criteria over another. Um, I wouldn't want to prejudge that, that at that moment in time, but I'm prepared to accept that that may have been the case in the past. So you are agreeing that you, you're going to review we, that and look back we will, that? We will review okay. that again, yes. Cabinet Secretary, do, I think maybe perhaps again in your presentation you did kind of touch on this, but I'll give you the opportunity again to maybe expand. Uh, do you have any plans to either extend the breadth of sites eligible for listing under the guidance or alternatively create a separate national policy on the recognition, protection and promotions uh, of sites of cultural importance which do not meet the current criteria of a listed monument? Well, one of the things to be aware of is we're, we're in a, a process of transition from uh, the merger of Historic Scotland and RCAMS. I talked about the bill that we went through, the Historic Environment Scotland Bill, which set out what ministers should do or not do in terms of direction. But also, um, it, the Historic Environment uh, Scotland Act also makes changes um, to improve procedures um, around scheduling and listing. Now, that is going to require a new set of regulations uh, to be laid. Uh, there's actually a public consultation currently underway. Um, it was launched on the 19th of December. The consultation ends um, uh, at the end of March. And the consultation itself is, is an opportunity to consider afresh uh, the impacts of heritage management work on a range of interests, including equalities in business and environment. And we want to ensure that Scotland's you know, heritage is managed in a way which meets the needs of the 21st century. And I think your, your initial question about the value of intrinsic and associative characteristics and where values like each each generation probably associates what's important, na what's nationally important in different ways perhaps that might have been done in previous years. Now, um, as, as uh, Barbara, has, uh, Barbara Cummins has set out, th this particular um, issue has challenged us in ways that you know, perhaps other, um, other monuments may not have done because of its particular characteristics. But I think it might be an opportunity that if the committee felt um, had a view about this, that the consultation that's currently underway would be a good and ideal opportunity for this committee to you know, express its views as to what it thinks in terms of that consultation. OK, then. Thank you. John. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Just to ask Ms Cummings, how many of the existing listed monuments are actually originate from minority cultures within Scotland? Because this petition is about a minority culture being recognised within the wider context of Scotland. Uh, and are there at the present time any listed monuments uh, that basically can trace its origin to minority culture within Scotland? That's not the way that we have recorded the, the, the monuments that we've scheduled or the buildings that we've listed. Um, we would be able to identify, um, in particular, listed buildings associated with minority cultures, um, uh, but it's, um, it, it's not the way that we've recorded things as, as they've evolved over time. In relation to scheduled monuments, quite often we don't know the origins of the creators. Um, it's evidence of human activity. We don't know who those humans were, so again, it would be very <coughs> difficult to identify that. Um, it's something that we'll, we'll have to consider in the future about how we capture the information of the, the groups that, um, that are represented in the historic environment. Um, and that's something that we'll have to do in the new organisation as Historic Environment Scotland. So can I... Remember, you know, you've got monuments that are thousands of years old. And, you know, what, how do we know what was the minority at the time of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. So that's a kind of, it's quite a challenge in historical terms, but uh, it's a point, I think, very much going forward of what we can do trying to go forward. And that's why the invitation to the committee is to say, if this is an, an issue that's important and, the, and this petition raises this issue, that's a good way to inform things going forward. But we can't necessarily unpick what's happened over thousands of years in the past or reschedule or renominate or reclassify things retrospectively. But what we can do is try and deal with things going forward. And this this petition provides us the opportunity to do so. I, Cabinet Secretary, I fully understand that some of the standing stones that exist in Scotland are, predate the pyramids. Uh, so the, really in terms of trying to find out who the original uh, builders uh, of those sites were uh, is under some dispute uh, you know, in terms of the... So I'm well aware of the history of some of the sites, but in some of the modern listed monuments 
then clearly we know uh, in some respects who was the architect, who commissioned the work, and what the original purpose of that building was. And it's really just to try and find out whether or not Historic Scotland currently keep a record of, if they can, I'm not, and I'm bearing in mind the uh, ancient monuments that exist, uh, if they keep a record of where that uh, listed monument may have actually originated from and the purpose of that building. Because, we, as I said, we have many buildings throughout uh, Scotland that we can actually trace back. And I'm talking about in the last three, four hundred, five hundred years. We also know in terms of the Antonine Wall, who constructed that. Uh, so it's really just trying to get to the situation where Historic Scotland can give us, particularly in the modern context, uh, some idea, uh, the significance to minority cultures within Scotland, where that listing came from. We would certainly include that information in the, um, the data that we, we would capture in terms of um, uh, when a building is listed, you get a list description. Um, that will tell you where the property is, what it is, and a history um, of it. The architect, as you say, um, perhaps who commissioned it, what its use was, uh, was for. So if a, if a particular minority group had commissioned it um, or had a history of use in it, that would be part of that, that history of that building. Um, that's a relatively recent phenomenon, um, the, the full um, data being produced as part of a, a, a listing uh, proposal. And with the advent of computer systems, it's certainly possible to, to search through records um, uh, now. In fact, we're, we're, um, we're constantly trying to upgrade the search facility um, on the, the, the listing search that you can carry out on our website um, so that keywords can, uh, can be brought out in that. Um, on one of the, um, uh, I suppose, the nuances of that is um, defining what uh, minority communities are because certain communities may well identify themselves as a distinct entity that um, we don't necessarily realise that they would, they would want to be identified in that sort of way. So where we've got some, a group like the Traveller community, well-known, well-documented um, and well-considered, uh, well then that's something that you can, you can pull out. But you may well have individual groups um, that would want to search for their, their background, um, you know, what's, what's the physical evidence of their, uh, their background in Scotland that we can't provide that material easily. Um, there are over 47,000 listed buildings in Scotland, so to search through individual records to pull that out is, is very difficult. But we're constantly trying to update our data to make that searching uh, easier. But that's going forward, which does mean that there's a legacy of, of older decisions made by our predecessors where that's not possible. Does History Scotland actively seek out uh, interested groups in the relation to listed monuments. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, where you've got, you know, it's easy with historic church buildings uh, that are listed, and in fact some modern church buildings, well, re relatively modern church buildings are listed buildings. Uh, I, but in terms of some of the other monuments, do you actively seek out those minority groups or individuals who may have a particular interest? Uh, and being associated with the, the monument? We haven't done specifically um, in the past. We do tend to focus on th themed areas. So at the moment, um, we're undergoing a review of um, courts and prisons. Um, part of that is because the public estate is considering its assets and disposing of things. So where we think there's an issue, then, then we'll address that. Clearly, there are um, communities that are poorly represented uh, in terms of the historic environment and what's designated at a national level. Um, so that's an area that we are giving active thought to considering for the future as part of those thematic reviews. Right, thank you very much indeed. And John, have you got a question? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Captain Secretary, I was, I was hoping that um, Barbara might be able to answer this um, question, and that is, we've got trusts up and down in Scotland, and I'm just wondering what level of engagement you've had with them. And I'm also wondering, uh, have you actually had direct contact with some of the boards, with your own board, in terms of how you would want to see this progress and possibly ha finishing the whole process with some sort of national conference in which we bring all those ideas together uh, and, and publish a, a report which would be meaningful. Um, in, I'm not quite sure that I understand. Is this in relation to the, the, the Tinker's Heart itself? Or no, it's, 
it's in, in relation to what we're trying to achieve in terms of identifying heritage and heritage sites and also in terms of how do we up, up keep those sites because I think more and more uh, it's becoming quite evident that we'll need help from the communities and businesses and, and, and others. And I'm just wondering what level of engagement you've had with the trusts to try and achieve that goal. It might be that I could assist a little. The, I think it would be fair to say that to date, uh, communities have in effect self-identified and asked to be involved with processes, as, as in this case. Uh, there is quite an active uh, community heritage, community uh, archaeology network across Scotland. We have an annual conference every year. Uh, last year's was held at uh, Creef. So the, there are ways in which communities can come together and have that discussion with the, uh, the professionals, if you like, already. Uh, I think that could, uh, will develop. It's only one sector. There are other people who feel that community engagement should be different. It shouldn't all be focused on archaeology and doing projects. It should be more about recognition uh, of, of life ways and so on. So I think there are already uh, forums, forums, forums in which that could take place. Uh, so, so I think that would be the, the first way is to use the existing mechanisms by which community groups come together to speak to professional archaeologists and others who are interested in this whole area of work. And maybe it is a quite a kind of complex area, but to, to draw to your attention that Scotland, for its first time ever, has its first ever historic environment strategy. Um, as part of that, I've pulled together a historic environment forum, which has just everybody's interest for its uh, kind of from community planning, from um, you know different areas of weather of, of interest. Um, bringing them together for the first time collectively and th there's a whole lot of different work streams underneath that and different parts of the historic environment community are helping lead areas uh, national trust for example are very much involved they've got a great kind of expertise in, in education and etc engagement there's one of the strands is about community and engagement now it, the, the, you know the strategy was just launched last year uh, we're bringing everyone together some of the, the points therefore will be about what we do for the country as a whole in looking at themes that we might want to, to take forward and i think that provides an opportunity you know for um I think a better engagement both at a national level but also to get voices heard that might not have otherwise been heard within our historic environment. Uh, we're looking at um, developing our first conference with, you know, of the following the, the historic environment uh, strategy. I can't predict what subjects there will be but actually the kind of engagement, the idea is that we, we've got to separate this perception that somehow um, historic buildings, it's a them and us, that, you know, it's the, between either ownership between Historic Scotland or National Trust or whoever, and the communities that live there, and one of the kind of real drivers for change is the, um, the real, um, I mean, the knowledge that local communities have often is better than some of the other uh, professionals around that, and how do you engage that better? So that's very much at the heart of what we're doing with the, our, it's called our place and time, it's our historic environment strategy. That might be a vehicle to take forward what the petition, you know, what, what, the, um, what the committee member is suggesting in terms of that kind of opportunity to share that experience. Well, that, that's, thank you, Chair, but that, that's, that's uh, very helpful, but I, I'm, I'm looking at historic Scotland leading in a way and and I was just wondering the level of engagement that you actually currently have with the, the various trusts in, in, in trusts. Scotland because end of the day um, if we're going to get a pound of flesh we need to make sure that we're engaging with everybody and everybody has access uh, to yourselves and vice versa so I'm just I'm just trying to pry out that level of engagement that you have currently uh, and or do you feel that you need more opportunities to, to develop that engagement? Um, yes to both. Um, we, we, we do currently engage with local trusts. Um, as, as Mr Foyet said, that does tend to be by them self-selecting. So um, a, a, an issue comes to our attention or we're in an area doing a particular piece of work and, um, and we engage with a trust um, over a particular site um, or work that they're undertaking. Perhaps they come to us for grant funding for a particular project. Um, so there are, there are many, many means by which the, they, they will approach us for our support and we always try and, and do that. In some cases it can be simply the act of um, supporting verbally and providing staff time um, for work. Um, for example, um, one of my members of staff is uh, working with the Friends of Eyemouth Fort 
um, who had a, a parliamentary reception here recently just to celebrate the work that they're doing. So the Trust's doing all the work. Um, they're, they're driving this, um, but with the support of um, Historic Scotland, um, local businesses and the local authority. So it's about bringing people together often is the role that we can, uh, that we can uh, play. Um, as I said, one of, one of the key things is, uh, is about promoting cooperation, but we can only promote that cooperation, we can't uh, compel it. Would we like to do more? Uh, absolutely. Um, if, uh, and that's one of the things that Historic Environment Scotland and through the Historic Environment Strategy will be considering how we do that and with the resources that we have. Finally, Chair, if you don't mind, just the last... La Thank you, Chair. Um, that's exactly what I'm driving at. Um, uh, whether we can support you in that, I, I, I don't know, but it's that level of engagement that I'm interested in. Uh, I think that it's, that's important. I, I don't want trust to feel that they've had lip service, uh, so therefore I think it's important that that level of engagement needs to be recognised of how, how deep that really is uh, to justify that level of engagement, I, I don't think lip service is, uh, is good enough for, uh, for, for what we're trying to achieve, Captain Secretary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you would have opportunity yeah. for yeah. partnership work in this year. Mm -hmm. Kenny? Yes, thanks. Uh, just building upon the applications from John Wilson. Interlinked. I mean, firstly, are you satisfied that current heritage protections sufficiently promote and protect the diverse heritage, including the contribution of minority cultures? As a follow-on from that, what equality safeguards exist within the current guidance, especially for those communities where written records, uh, etc., are not so easily available? And finally, as a consequence of uh, public sector equality duty requirements, do you anticipate any changes? And if so, will they have any effect upon the heart? So it's basically what we can't do, minority rights, any changes as well, public sector equality. If I may be starting, I'll, I'll ask Barbara to, to ask that kind of final, final point. I mean, that's what I was saying in terms of looking at the, you know, we were, you know, we're live and actively now in a consultation which is about saying that going forward what's going to be important in terms of uh, scheduling and listing and how we can improve procedures around that and do we need to make sure that equalities issues are probably more forefront than they might have been in the past in 1979 when some of the legislation that we're referring to was first established obviously SHEP which is the historic environment policy was uh, early 2000s initiated and then refreshed in 2011 so one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm inviting the committee to do is that you know obviously the less that can be learned from this petition can be fed into that. We can certainly do that, but it might be helpful if the petition committee itself decided to. But in relation to, to the final point on equality duties, do you want to? Um, yes, um, we will um, be setting up new processes and procedures to set up the new organisation, Historic Environment Scotland. So we'll be revisiting the services we deliver um, and the processes that we uh, undertake to deliver those services. As part of that, we will have to undertake um, and a qualities impact assessment of those processes to ensure that they are robust, that we aren't um, uh, undervaluing particular areas or disenfranchising particular groups um, or, or, or parts of our community. So that, that is our intention. Um, clearly, this case um, accelerates that in relation to the, the scheduling process, um, and I'm sure that we'll learn a lot from that. Okay. John. Convener, thank you very much indeed. Just in terms of the, the issues uh, in relation to the Tinker's Heart and whether or not, given the issues that have been raised, because I was quite interested in a comment made by the Cabinet Secretary in her opening remarks, where she indicated that it would only go ahead if there was agreement with the owners of the site. Now, that is very important for many communities who are, are trying to achieve uh, their ambition to recognise a historic monument, to preserve that historic monument uh, into the future. But if there is no agreement with the site owner, then what can be done by Historic Scotland uh, to ensure uh, the cooperation uh, of the site owner, to ensure that the the monument can be recognised and preserved because, the, in particular in relation to this petition, there have been things that have happened to this site in the past, uh, particularly the cattle gaining access to the site, the damage that was caused uh, by the cattle, and the, while the current owners have taken some work underhand, the difficulty is for the, the petitioner 
as they feel there is still much to do in preserving this site and actually recognising this as a historic monument for the travelling community in Scotland. I think that comes to the nub of, of, of the issue, I think, for this petition, because, as I've said, we can reconsider the scheduling, which is what is happening using the uh, criteria that is, uh, Barbara has set out. That's what's going to be done um, as a new process going forward. But in terms of actually restoring and preserving the site, which is what the petition actually says, mm -hmm. uh, what does that actually mean in terms of what does restoration mean and what does preservation mean and what does it look like for all the communities involved, the travel community, but also the local community, but also in terms of um, trying to, to make any improvements that people are, are, are talking about or even maintaining what's there in a satisfactory way, you need the cooperation of the owners. The vast majority of uh, monuments, remember, we've got 300,000 in terms of uh, you know, the, kind of the monuments we have, um, are in private ownership um, in some shape or form. Um, and the cooperation that does exist is probably the things you don't hear about, is the very good cooperation that takes place and the role that um, you know, owners have in looking after their own monuments or indeed work increasingly, and that refers to Hanzala's point, uh, Hanzala Malik's point about the local trusts or communities and the Adopt a Monument um, process, for example, which was uh, set up by Historic Scotland that's run by Archaeology uh, Scotland and funded from Historic Scotland to do that is precisely about trying to get better community um, kind of... It's not necessarily about who owns it, but who cares for it because you want it, what you want is it cared for. And... Um, that happens in the vast, vast majority of cases. But it, if you don't get cooperation from an owner, and it's highly unusual to be in that situation, highly unusual, because the vast majority you know, are, are doing this in day in, day out, and it's really difficult. Now, what you can, what Historic Scotland can do, and Barbara can maybe talk about this a bit more, Barbara Cummings can talk about this a bit more, is facilitate conversations. Now, the process that um, Historic Scotland are now embarking on may help in the facilitation of the conversations so there's a common understanding but in, to get I think progress going forward there needs to be cooperation and a new I don't know a new, a new arena or a new space or for the local community the landowner and the travelling community to actually come to some agreement as to what's needed that actually I think would be the way forward for the particular issues in this petition but as I said you know, as, as uh, Cabinet Secretary, I wouldn't direct um, Historic Scotland in any particular site that they currently look after. Uh, I can't direct them for a site that they don't look after. Uh, what I can do is provide advice as to my experience as a Cabinet Secretary of a number of years in this area, that a lot of it is about good communication, good relationships going forward, and perhaps um, the, the process of, of looking at the, the, the scheduling in a new light, bearing in mind the, the equalities um, duties that Barbara Cummins referred to, may be an opportunity for people to have those discussions, but in a new, in a, in a new position. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, I have the, I'd like to welcome the decision to, to review the scheduling. I think that's very, uh, very helpful. But I have the advantage of having been at the site actually there this morning. I bought, uh, drove past it, but I was there last Monday. I have some photographs which I'd be happy to provide to the committee because the reality of the site is uh, rather different from what we've heard. Kate Howe, Convener, the landowner, wrote to the commit this committee on the 14th of December, and she said two things that I think the committee might want to consider. One is, as you're aware, neither the Scottish Parliament nor our Garland Butte Council feel that the site is of sufficient historical interest to merit a listing. So that's her understanding of the listing <laughs> process, that this isn't important enough. And I think that does say something significant. But she then says, I can assure you the site is well looked after and protected against cattle, I consider that enough has been done to ensure that everyone wishing to visit the Tinker's Heart can do so. Well, the pictures I have show a rather different uh, story. There is a, an agricultural trailer parked virtually next to the heart. There is a sign on the gate, uh, which uh, doesn't have an apostrophe with Tinker's, but let that pass. A, it says, Tinker's and other local people used to be married at this spot as it was a central meeting point. That's not true. That's not the reason it was done. It was because it was there as, as a sacred site for the travelling people and others. For example, Isabella Brodie Langlarton and John Luke Cole Cottage were married here in 1872, rather cleverly choosing uh, two people who weren't travellers in order to advertise the site. The heart has recently been refurbished and protected thanks to Ardno Estate and here we are. Um, to refurbish a site of this importance presumably re would require some professional assistance. Was any sought from Historic Scotland? Not that I'm aware of, no. 
So a site of this importance has been interfered with by a landowner who now thinks it is sufficient unto the day, essentially. I'm also slightly surprised. I wonder if Barbara Cummins would just address this. I'm slightly surprised by the remarks she made that, whilst I, I do appreciate this is a difficult issue, that Historic Scotland is powerless. When people interfere with scheduled monuments and historic buildings that are scheduled, then the law can be used. I, I mean, I suppose one could call in evidence the endless case of, of Chiram Castle, or one could call in Rowallan Castle. So there would be the possibility of preventing further damage to this site uh, and perhaps then helping the landowner to have better access. Because at the present moment, it doesn't matter what the travelling community thinks. The landowner has said what she thinks, and what she thinks is this is over and done with. Am I right about the protection of sites? Yes and no. Um, if a site is scheduled, then it's protected from deliberate damage. Um, if it's not scheduled, then it's, it's not, there, and there's, there's no obligation. Um, there, there's a protection under the planning system from change through the planning process, um, so it has to be taken account of as part of that, uh, that decision-making. But it doesn't require consent to carry out works to a monument if it's not scheduled. If it is scheduled, it needs scheduled monument consent to intervene in any way to restore or to, um, to excavate, for example. Um, so at the moment, um, works could be carried out to, to the monument without consent. So going ahead without involving us in the works that have undertaken so far, there's no, uh, there's no breach in the law in, uh, in that at the moment. You wouldn't regard it as good practice, however, to, on any scheduled mon monument, for example, to build a metal case around it, park an agricultural trailer next to it, and have an inaccurate sign on a gate that doesn't tell you the truth about the monument. That wouldn't be the standard that Historic Scotland would aspire to to see our monuments treated in that way? There would be little that we could do if it didn't actually intervene in the, in the scheduled area. So there, you know, if, if you're on agricultural land, there's, there are activities that are undertaken around monuments on agricultural land all the time that have the potential to impact on your enjoyment or your appreciation of a monument that we can't intervene in. With respect, what I actually asked you was... If there was an agricultural trailer parked next to such a site, mm -hmm. if there was a metal, aesthetically extremely ugly metal container around it, and if there was a, site, a, a notice that didn't tell you the truth, that wouldn't be good practice. It wouldn't be what we would want to see at no. our own sites, indeed. No. Thank you. Angus. Um, I was certainly pleased to hear uh, in the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks uh, that she acknowledged the importance of the, the Tinker's Heart, uh, and it's clear from uh, her comments that the, the scheduling of the, the monument rests fully with Historic Scotland. However, I also noted uh, Barbara Cummins' uh, comments that scheduling would not achieve the aims of the petition. Um, however, I was pleased to hear that uh, uh, there are exceptional circumstances in this case, and it was heartening to hear that the case will be revisited. Um, now, there, there does seem to be... Um, a degree of intransigence from the, the landowner, um, as, as Mike Russell has uh, alluded to, and it's unfortunate, uh, to say the least, that she's not been more accommodating. Um, and I was struck by comments made by uh, my colleague Mike Russell uh, in the national newspaper just a few days ago. Um, and, well, Mr Russell's here, if, if, I, if I could uh, quote... Uh, a paragraph from the piece. Oh, <laughs> um, he mentions uh, that the heart needs the creation of proper access, which would be easy as there is a disused road right next to it, which could be made into a small parking area. The installation of sympathetic information boards, upgraded surroundings, and proper care. And the salient point in that paragraph is a progressive landlord would give the small area involved to a trust made up of travellers and local people. Uh, and that solution needs to be taken forward. Now, clearly, if the, the landowner were to gift or lease the site uh, to allow access for the travellers and their trust, uh, that would go a long way, I personally believe, to, to resolving uh, the issue on the ground. Now, Historic Scotland uh, state in the letter to the committee that financial assistance is available to the owner uh, of the, the site of the heart uh, to care for the site, uh, and presumably that would apply to any trust uh, that's allowed to take over. Um, what is the process for applying for these funds uh, and what some can be applied for should either the landowner or a trust wish to apply? Um, 
how long is a piece of string? Um, it very much depends on the project that comes forward, um, uh, what it's for, what support it has, what it's, what it's trying to achieve. Um, well, you know, we're, if, we're if, it's, if it's to the betterment of the, of, of the monument, then um, you know, we funded all sorts of, of projects from local community uh, bodies for, for them to improve um, the, 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 the monument itself, um, the interpretation, protection, protective measures uh, around it. We've, we've funded all, all sorts of things like that, and it doesn't generally involve large sums of money uh, to achieve these things. But say the, the formation of a parking area on the disused section of road, uh, the old road. I'm, I'm not... For example, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know if we would fund um, the, the creation of a of a car park. Um, that's uh, that's that's generally new works, not necessarily associated with the monument itself. As part of a wider project, if um, uh, if there are funds required to achieve a, an overall uh, project that includes that, um, it could be part of that package. Um, but we haven't seen something come forward for us to respond to. Um, we have various grant funding programmes um, that, can be, can, that can be applied to, um, but it does require the cooperation of all parties. Um, a private landowner um, a, a can, must give their permission for, for a grant funding to, proposal to be successful. So, um, as the Cabinet Secretary said, maybe part of the conversations that will be starting now with us revisiting the case will create a different environment where different, com different conversations can have and, and more cooperation can be fostered. That would certainly help to, to, to move things forward. Um, can I ask the, the, the Cabinet Secretary um, if you're satisfied that uh, su sufficient funding is available under the current heritage protections uh, to maintain a uh, the protected uh, listed monuments? Um, well, obviously, we're, we're, as you all know, we're uh, in challenging financial circumstances. Um, any support from the petition to increase my budget would be greatly appreciated. However, um, the reality is we have to manage within uh, the constraints that we have. But one of the things that I've been absolutely clear about in recent years, despite a real significant reduction in my budget, I've got one of the smallest budgets, so therefore reductions actually can have an, an even bigger impact. What I have done is managed to maintain the grant spent um, from Historic Scotland, and that was a very important part of what I wanted to do because grant spend, one is spent in local communities, it usually involves local contractors, um, you know, whether it's in building merchants or whatever, kind of in, in local areas, um, and also helps... Um, ensure that skills and training can be continued in a, in a difficult environment. So uh, within uh, you know, challenging budgets, I've actually managed to maintain the grant spend that goes out to outside organisations, whether it's through um, large organisations like National Trust or indeed small organisations like the Trust that um, uh, you know, Hansel referred to. Now, I wouldn't micromanage what grants, again, I refer to that in my statement, I can't tell and shouldn't be telling Historic Scotland uh, which particular projects or trust uh, to, to fund or not fund. What I can do is provide the, um, the overall pot to, to allow them to do, do that, and it's been extremely challenging. Um, and there are challenges ahead in terms of our estates, um, both cared for by Historic Scotland or in other cases when they're not, that needs funding and, and uh, preservation. And our heritage, our built heritage, is at the heart of our tourism industry. People come to Scotland to see what we have. Um, so it's really important that we protect that. And any support I can get from this petition, or indeed at MSPs generally, for the built environment would be gratefully uh, appreciated. OK, uh, indeed. And, and with regard to the, the overall pot... Uh, from, from the Scottish Government. Has there been any assessment uh, made of what funds will be needed now and in the future to protect Scotland's listed monuments? Gosh, that's, a, that, that's the big... Uh, I think it is the million-dollar question. Uh, we are currently assessing um, across the country um, what is required, and it is a large amount, because what you can't have is obviously big health and safety issues for a lot of our uh, properties... Uh, if there's any concern about them, they may need to close. Uh, so, therefore, constant investment is required. Uh, we also are cooperating. I've referred to the Historic Environment Forum that um, I talked about uh, earlier. The National Trust has gone, undergone uh, review itself, again, of its own properties going forward. And the methodology and the lessons learned from them is being shared also um, across with Historic Scotland in, in terms of their work. So, yes, that work is being done. Um, it's also an issue that I've engaged with the relevant committee of the Parliament, the Education Culture Committee. OK, thanks very much. Um, just one salient point, that, if I may just, just put on record, it was noted in the, some of the papers that we received that... Uh, the Tinker's Heart and the old road that has been stocked up uh, actually would have been provided to the current landowner uh, free of charge. Uh, so it's just to get that on the record. When, when it was stocked up. 
Si? When, when, to... when the land was, uh, when the road was stopped up, the old road, um, it was uh, owned by Argyll and Butte Council. Ah, right, okay. but then it would have been transferred at that point free of charge to the, the current landowner. We would need to double check this, but it's quite common that roads, uh, public roads, uh, the land underneath the road remains in the ownership of the, the landowner. The council uses it for as long as it's needed and then returns it to the landowner. So I think it's true the road surface and the work okay. done to the heart was probably done by the council, but the landowner probably retained ownership of, I think it's a solemn is the correct legal term, yep. throughout the period from beginning to end. Okay. John Walsh. Thank you, Convener. Uh, sorry for coming in again, but I just want to get on the record while we've got Ms Cummings here in the Cabinet Secretary, is that Ms Cummings, in response to one of the questions earlier, you said you would expect the cooperation of all parties to take this forward. The Cabinet Secretary, as I referred to earlier, they basically referred to agreement with owners of the site. Clearly, what you've been provided with in response is there seems to be some intransigence by the owner of the site to accommodate what the petitioner is looking for. And I know in terms of all the issues that have been raised in the petition may not be accommodated because of uh, some of the damage that's already been to the site. But what happens in the event that the owner of the site is not prepared to cooperate, is not prepared to work in partnership or uh, with the people presenting this petition and the community they represent, what powers does Historic Scotland have or the Scottish Government to ensure that what the petitioner is looking for can be best preserved other than the situation where we just leave it to the owner to decide what happens to the site? And I think Mike Russell alluded to earlier in terms of his comments that the site is not being presented at its best at the present moment. So what hope have we for the future that this site will be preserved in a way that is appropriate and meets the needs of the travelling community in Scotland? Well, quite clearly, it needs cooperation of the, of the landowner. I also suggest the local community as well as the travel community, that kind of tripartite um, proposal is the way forward. But in terms of you know, what can be done, I mean, the only ultimate, ultimate thing you can do is to take it into compulsory ownership. Uh, that's highly, highly unusual. We can't, I've asked officials to identify if that's ever happened before. That's not, nothing that we've, either by the local authority or by, um, or by government. But that's, there's been absolutely no precedent that we can identify um, of that uh, having to take, be taken place. And I think that's the ultimate. I don't think that's, that's a highly, highly, um, it's the last point of last resort. Um, and has not happened in any other cases. What you can have, and I think um, Angus MacDonald alluded to this, is some kind of, you know, it's a trust issue or guardianship or um, other other options are available. Um, in terms of, you know, when you have uncooperative landowners, well, we've got a land reform bill currently being looked at. You've got community empowerment legislation about what that means and, and these issues. So therefore, I think what this petition does do is it raise, raises, it's obviously one specific case, but it's quite distinct and unique for lots of different reasons and it has to be treated as such, and that's why I welcome Historic Scotland's uh, deci decision also to revisit on a, on a new basis. But I do think that um, you know there are, are, are bigger issues here to do with, with what happens with landowners and their relationship <coughs> with local communities, which won't be resolved by Historic Scotland in this one individual case and won't necessarily be resolved, um, as I said, by the petition itself. But that's, that begs bigger, bigger questions and bigger issues. Uh, but you know, I would say. You know, my job is to manage the whole of the historic environment, to work with all the good practice that takes place with all the landowners, and, and uh, I wouldn't want to compromise my relationship with them um, by doing something in one case that would jeopardise that very fruitful and productive relationship that we're building um, with the wider sector um, currently. Thank you. Mike? I just want to point out to the, the, the committee convener that there is a trust established by the travellers in Scotland, um, who have shown great willingness to work with the Here We Are team, for example, uh, who have a close association with, uh, with Mrs Howe and her family, but are very keen to work with the community, and that there is a vehicle available to undertake this task and to take it forward. I think the role of the committee in encouraging that would be helpful. So do I think the role of Historic Scotland in encouraging the landowner to be more cooperative. I know that the uh, Arkham's had met with the landowner. I don't think Historic Scotland has met with the landowner yet. 
and I think it would be very useful if they did meet with the landowner and try their charms on them. Okay. Now, as there are no further questions, I, I will now ask the committee to decide what action it wishes to take on the petition. Uh, members have a note by the clerk that sets out possible course of action and what the members' views. Uh, do have any views, colleagues? Yes, I mean, I think, um, I mean, clearly um, it would be good if we could get a paper from the clerks uh, to, to cover everything that's been discussed today. However, I would be keen um, to keep the petition open until uh, the issue has been re revisited by Historic Scotland and we find out what the, the outcome of that is. I believe um, Ms Cummings mentioned it was three to six months uh, timescale. Um, and also uh, pick up on the Cabinet Secretary's suggestion that the committee feeds into the uh, uh, consultation um, and also perhaps write to the Rural Affairs Committee uh, to highlight the issue in advance of the Land Reform Bill uh, going through the parliamentary process. Would the committee be willing to write to the landowner to encourage cooperation? Um, I do think that perhaps it's a little bit of... Um, gentle persuasion to the landowner that this is, you might use the Cabinet Secretary's evidence too, that um, this is highly unusual that a landowner would say that they consider enough had been done to ensure that everyone visiting a site could do so and to point out the difficulties there. And Historic Scotland were also doing that. One might call it a uh, two-pronged attack. And Zala? I'm very uh, interested in uh, comments from Historic Scotland in terms of uh, legal recourse to protect sites in Scotland. I think um, we want to ensure that if uh, all other efforts fail, that there is some sort of legal recourse in which sites could be protected. Uh, and if they, you could come back with some uh, recommendations in that area, it would be very helpful. I think that um, sometimes people can damage sites without realizing. Uh, and, you know, we have to give people uh, that opportunity to redress that. I'm, I would be surprised if, if owners of, of heritage sites would not want to maintain them because it's probably just as important for them as it is for anybody else. So I think we need to work hand in glove with people. But I think if all other efforts fail, all other reasonable efforts fail, I, I think that perhaps there may be a, a recourse uh, from a legal point of view to, to protect Scottish heritage for the future. Do the rest of the members agree then with the proposal that's put forward? Right. Yeah, the yeah, committee agreed they want to write to the winner. That's it. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and Barbara for uh, attending? Thank you. Can we suspend for a couple of minutes, please? The next item of business is in consideration of three new petitions and the committee agreed to hear from the petitioners on all three. The first new petition is PE 
1540 by Douglas Feeland on the permanent solution for the A83. Members have a note by the clerk and the spice briefing and the petition. And may I welcome Councillor Feeland and his colleagues, Councillor Donald Kelly and Councillor John McAlpine from Argyll first to this meeting. Uh, Mike Russell uh, is also staying for this item and as he is a constituent interest and also in attendance is Jamie McGregor, MSP, who also has a constituent interest. So could I now invite Councillor Feeland, who I believe is want to start on behalf of his colleagues, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, firstly, just to thank you and the committee for the, the opportunity to present the petition here. But I think uh, also a special thanks to Michael and to Jamie for their support for today. And I think, Convener, that illustrates the, the level of support that we have. We have cross-party support from both Michael, Jamie and other MSPs and also our MP, Alan Reid. We also have support from a Gallen Butte Council, from our community councils and our business community. So effectively, we are here advocating on behalf of our Gallen Butte, although it's in name by, by myself. So I think that's an important point to, to start off with. Equally so, it's important to point out that the, the, the tremendous amount of work the Scottish Government has done to this point. There's absolutely no doubts that when we came two or three years ago, I don't think we, we would have had as much as we've got within the A83 had it not been for the intervention, both of, well, initially it was the, 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 the Petitions Committee and also the Scottish Government as well. has to be recognised, there's no doubts about that. I think where, where we're coming from is presenting some evidence now to the committee to say actually what has been agreed and, and what has been put in place is just to question how vulnerable that is in, in terms of our Gale and Butte and is that a permanent solution? We believe not with some of the evidence we'll put forward and, and obviously uh, answer any questions that may be put to us. Just to give you, uh, the last, there was a meeting of our task force which was on the 14th of January 2015 and it was in relation to our last uh, event, uh, the landslide, which was in October 2014. A report was given back and, and specifically it was, uh, there was uh, some specific mention made of the netting which was to protect uh, the, the roadside. And I'll just read, it was a, a, from Eddie Ross who was from Bear Scotland who stated, 2,500 tonnes of material came down from the hillside Eddie Ross made reference to the fence being struck during that event. Eddie Ross indicated that the previous largest landslide amount was 1,000 tonnes. It confirmed that 1,700 tonnes of material was caught by the fence, including boulders, ultimately saving the A83 carriageway structure. Eddie Ross then indicated that the fence was designed to withstand 1,000 tonnes, so it successfully held more than was anticipated. I think that's quite a poignant point because although it was the 1,000 tonnes, we can't predict the size of the landslide and here we have a 2,500 tonne landslide and the effects that that had. From that, there were other consequences of, of what had happened on that particular incident. And Michael brought this up in terms of there was the, the bottom, the, the old military road had been flooded on two occasions so that our contingency plan had then been cut off which then meant the 65 miles round trip and we had to, to you know, for, for our, our to get into Argyle, basically. Um, and not only had, had that been cut off, is that there was also, and particularly at night times, if there's been a landslide, they have to do risk assessments. And if there are risk assessments, that obviously takes time. And that's totally understandable for safety reasons and so forth. But I think it's the unpredictability of, of the events of now we're hearing that, that's, that the nets can take 1,000 tonnes and we have had a 2,500 tonne fall. And what effects will that have and what other sizeable um, landslides and landslips will there be. So I think that's important as evidence because that's factual and, and actual evidence that the committee can hear. Also, I think, as I say, we've advocated that it's a permanent solution. We believe this is not a permanent solution despite all the hard efforts and hard work that's been put in and the evidence is now there in, in some of the reports that we, that we have had. I'll now maybe ask Donald if he would also add to that with your permission, Convener, just to add some more information and obviously then happy to take any questions from that. Great. Th thanks, Convener. <clears throat> Just to add to the points that my, my colleague, Councillor Fyland, has, has made there, uh, obviously the Argyland Butte Council signed up to the single outcome agreement and we suffered greatly, as everyone knows in this chamber, from depopulation. Uh, the 83 is the main arterial route going into Argyland Butte and because of the problems that we have and continue to have with the rest and be thankful, it is certainly putting off business travelling, moving into Argyland Butte. It's creating a situation whereby uh, that you know, for businesses who work and live within Argyll and Butte, uh, an uncertain uh, business uh, situation 
We have, a, uh, on a regular basis, flashing lights on the 83, on the rest of Bethalville, whereby even if we don't have a landslide, there is a pre-warning of a landslide, so this creates a lot of uncertainty. These lights could be on maybe every time it's wet, these lights could be on, and we've got an email that's widely uh, publicised by Transport Scotland to say uh, risk of landslide. Well, that's numerous businesses have been affected by that because people have just said we're not travelling, uh, you know, tourists especially, and also uh, even, even students travelling to university and things like that, you know, they've been put off by that. Uh, because it's too onerous uh, to actually maybe travel the other way. They don't link up with other uh, buses, trains at the other end of Glasgow, for example. But the key thing here is that, you know, we came here in 2012 and we did have four kind of, say, component parts of the petition, three of which are being addressed. But the key one was for a permanent solution, which at that time the committee agreed that they would take forward a permanent solution for the 83 at the rest of Bethalville. We've had, despite the measures that have been put in place, basically a piecemeal approach to the situation, whereby each time there's been a landslide, there's been a further piece of netting added at that particular location to try and uh, resolve the situation, and that's been ongoing now for three years. So we've, we've got, we're in a position where, in the community, basically, they refer to it as a stick and plaster approach. So it's totally, you know, when we had 10,000 people for Gail and Butte signed the petition, over 400 businesses signed the petition from out with and, in, and within Argyll and Butte. All the community councils, all the MSPs that represented the area, the MP, Chamber of Commerce, etc., etc., etc. At that time, these people are still there. They're still looking for a permanent solution. And the bottom line is, if this situation had occurred in the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, for example, it would be, it'd be resolved by now. There'd been something done. They feel very kind of aggrieved in some respects. You know, I take on board what Councillor Fylan said regarding the, the money that's been spent. But when the report was done by Jacobs, uh, they were commissioned to do the reports with various options put on the table. And they obviously they went for the cheapest option, which is still obviously causing problems. And I've asked at task force meetings, uh, can back a couple of task force meetings, to consider uh, for the task force and for the government to consider working up one of the other potential options so it's there in readiness should a major landslide occur in, in the 83, which basically cuts us off. Uh, and I was told, no, we'll just continue with this approach at the moment. So as far as we're concerned as a girl, first, we will continue to campaign until such times as we have a proper solution to this problem. Thank you. Mr. Pankalpi, <coughs> would you like to add anything to that? Really, at this point in time, I welcome any questions you have. I'm, I'm quite happy with what my colleagues have said, you know, and I think they've summed up very well. Questions? Right. In the last meeting, thank you. I mean, as you know, I support the, the intention of the petition. But the last meeting of the task force was uh, attended by the Council's deputy uh, leader, uh, Ellen Morton. And she heard a presentation from the new minister who accepted the principle of continuous access, which I think is what we're talking about, um, and, and who also, in response to a point a, that I made, uh, the committee agreed to meet, the task force agreed to meet earlier um, uh, than July, which when it was scheduled to, and to start the consideration of an alternative route to put that in place. So I think a lot of what you are arguing for is already happening. But it, just in terms of the council's position, now that the council is fully represented on the task force, uh, is it perhaps possible for them to use the task force, because I was conscious of the fact that the task force wasn't yet being used in this way, to put forward that strong argument from the council's perspective, as well as from the elected MSP's perspective, and from the community perspective, that there now needs to be the planning put in place for that alternative route, because there isn't an ag agreement yet on what that alternative route should be. Some have been ruled out, like the tunnel, but there are still some options. The, the forest road is one, the upgrading of the old military road, one of those and a lid over the road, the Donald Clark option, as it's called, because he writes letters about it every week to the papers. Uh, would they, your group, as part of the administration, you are part of the administration of Regal and Butte Council, as part of the administration, then start to use the 83 task force for that purpose? 
convene, I would say yes, uh, Michael. That would be the first thing. I don't think there's. Uh, it was unfortunate on that particular day, myself and Donald couldn't make it. The, the weather was particularly difficult and bad, and there was no doubts about that. We have had a regular attendance. We have been there on, on that occasion. But I think to answer Michael's question, I think avenues that we have of possibilities to explore. I think that's what we are doing. We're using the you know the democratic process, exercising our right to ask for the support also of the, the committee as well. Because I think. I suppose from the evidence point of view is that it was extremely effective, even though the task force was there in place with the committee, it's extremely effective to, to allow us to move to where we're at. So, yes, we would certainly use that, Michael, but I would still... I think the only point of difference, convenient, is whether continued investment in mitigation, which is not mm. finished yet, is, should take place before there is further planning for an alternative permanent route, or whether the two things should go in parallel at the moment and I have to say, whatever position the committee chooses to take, I, I agree with um, Donald and Douglas and John that mitigation, whilst necessary, needs to happen at the same time as planning for an alternative route. I think that is the agreement, and I think uh, if that point is, is made to the committee, that would be the most effective thing. I think I'm right in saying that, isn't it, aren't I? Yeah. Councillor okay, Kelly. I fully, I fully appreciate what Mr Russell is saying there and take it on board, but the bottom line is when we came to the committee you know, three years ago, the committee did agree a permanent solution would be the actual ultimate objective. And it's taken another three years of uh, disruption within Argyll and Butte, and we're still in a position where we're having a permanent solution. And I think it needs to be fast-tracked, because I think you know, if we continue down this line uh, you know, without actually pushing and pushing and pushing hard. And I'm, I'm fully taking on board what Mike's saying. You know, I think we need to uh, have a, a, an end game here, an end time. You know, we need to actually timeline how it's got to move forward because uh, if we don't do that, I fear in another 10 years we'll still be in the same position. Okay. Jackson. Convener, apologies for my late attendance uh, earlier. Um, uh, following on from what Mike Russell said, and... I remember the previous petition, and I, mean, I think I joined the committee after it had had a, a long-running uh, <laughs> history at that point in any event. Um, but I'm, I'm actually slightly unsure as to what you're asking us to do, because when I look at your petition, it seems that what you're asking us to do is to urge the Scottish Government to find a permanent solution. Uh, and I'm quite sure the committee will be quite happy to write to the Scottish Government encouraging them to do exactly that. Uh, but what I don't know that we are really being asked to do here, uh, or as far as I can see, is to become some arbiter as to what a permanent solution might be. Uh, and to those members of the committee who are perhaps slightly less familiar with the area, and I mean, I, I understand it, and of course I would be bereft if Jamie McGregor and Mike Russell were prevented from arriving at Parliament because of some landslip on, on the road. It would be a, a great loss to us all, I'm sure. Um, but I've, you know, like others, I've been on this road and, and been diverted. So I understand the... But for people who are less familiar with the area, I, it's, it, if you're asking us to find a solution, if that's what you're asking us to do, I don't know that we are the ones to do that. Certainly, I think, as we did with the previous p petition, we're very keen that a solution should be found because it is a problem of enormous long-standing. Um, but I'm not clear from the submissions I've received of any more detail other than, as Mike Russell rehearsed, the various kind of outline options that have previously been advertised. So what exactly do you want the committee to do? I think basically we're, we're back to square, as far as I'm concerned, we're back to basically square one. And I see this as coming back to the, the very start of this petition. I mean, we've had a, a, an, a, an attempt to find a permanent solution, which the committee agreed to three years ago, would be the ultimate goal of the committee. Uh, and the attempt has, has failed. Up until now, it's failed because we have a, a situation there where we've got a piecemeal approach to landslides, which are adversely affecting the whole community within Argyll and Butte, with the work continuing with 82 as well, for a problem there and a problem in 83, that's it, we're basically cut off completely. So I think, you know, I'd be urging the committee, as you say, to write directly to, to the government and put a bit of pressure on the government to actually come up with maybe one of the solutions they've already got on the table, because they're not moving that forward at the moment. Minister Keith Brown, when he was responsible for that, that remit, basically said at a task force meeting, We've, we've, we've done the, the red route, as they call it, that's the work on netting the rest to be thankful as it is at the moment. And at that time, and this was going back a, a couple of meetings, he basically said uh, that's as much as we'll be doing at this moment in time, which to me is not acceptable because we're still under the same situation as we were when we first came to petition this. 
So, I mean, I'm sorry if, I, if I'm repeating myself, but I feel very, very strongly about this. There's a lot of uh, dismay within the wider Argyll community how this has been moved forward. It's adversely affecting businesses, which is affecting jobs, and I mentioned the single outcome agreement. It's affecting tourism. We're trying to portray our Gail and Butte open for business in a positive way. But this, this is just, uh, you know, regardless of much work done elsewhere, removing pinch points, road surfaces, etc., etc., this is the arterial route, and this needs to be addressed. Uh, well, Convener, I, I don't want to preempt the discussion. I know Jamie McGregor would like to get into, but, but it does seem to me that what all the committee can do at this stage is write to the Government and Transport Scotland, and perhaps, having considered what they have to say, take further evidence if we feel that would assist in trying to move the matter forward. But I'm, I'm at a loss as beyond that as to what we can usefully contribute at this point. Very effective as well, and that would be very, very welcome because it further endorses, a, a, for, for my mind, that, 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 that you are helping and assisting the residents of Argyll and Butte as a committee, as a, as a cross section committee, to simply, if it's simply just to do that, I think to get that level of support, I think just endorses the whole, it's taking the whole issue, and you have taken it seriously, but it's to continue to, as Donald says, get to the end point, which is the permanent solution. So to have your support, um, it would be absolutely welcome. Jamie? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm most grateful to have this opportunity. I'd like to make a, sh a short statement, if I may. Um, and and uh, I, I want to support um, Councillors Kelly, Fyland and McAlpine, as I did three years ago. Uh, and I commend them for their continuing and impressive efforts uh, to maintain pressure on the Scottish Government on this major strategic transport issue. Uh, and I've been doing that myself. Um, the A83 trunk road is key... Uh, it's a key artery into Argyll and Butte, and the repeated closures of this trunk road, because of numerous landslides at the Rest and Be Thankful, uh, leaves much of Argyll and Butte cut off. Closures hit businesses across Argyll, and they inconvenience local residents and commuters, and it's very bad for tourism. They also send out negative measures um, uh, to all sorts of other visitors and those who would, not cons would consider investing in the area, and we can't afford up there for this to continue, not least as we face a very real problem in terms of trying to tackle predicted depopulation in Argyll and Butte, which was the subject of my own members' debate in Parliament just last month. A first-class road network is key to tackling depopulation. If anyone disagrees with that, then let them speak now and say why they disagree. Um, the, the, the irony is the rest, and be thankful as it's called, the rest is at the top, not halfway up. And that's where people are getting stuck, and, and it's not good enough. And um, we recognise that some investment has been made by the Scottish Government, and we now have a relief road which can be used in emergencies under a convoy system in the event of landslides closing the rest and be thankful. But it takes sometimes hours to activate it, and the convoy system is painfully slow and time-consuming. Also, the A819 between Inverary and Dalmally, which I know very well, is most unsuited to being a constant diversion, especially for heavy lorries. What we have is a sticking plaster solution, and the petitioners are entirely right to call for a permanent solution. This might be a canopy option, and we should look to the European continent, where countries have been able to use canopies or tunnels to protect vital road links, for example, in the French Alps. Uh, the Scottish Government could do worse than start by doing a costing for the canopy for the 400-metre section, uh, which I believe has been referred to as the Donald Clark solution. Um, private estimates suggest that this canopy might only cost... It might be less than £5 million. Um, and there's a strong feeling within Argyll and Butte that if a trunk road in a central belt had encountered similar repeated problems, then a permanent solution would have been found already. Um, uh, the, the, the Scottish Government needs to... Uh, I think, actually, Jackson got to the uh, nub of it. Um, what, uh, you know, t when saying, what are they actually asking for? And I think that was put very well by a 90-year-old constituent, a Mrs Valerie Cox, who lives near Loch Gilpet, who handed me this card. It says, mend the rest, and we'll be thankful. And I think that's what they're asking, asking the Scottish Government to do. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Jamie. Uh, is there no any further questions or statements? Okay. John? Can I just, uh, in terms of 
I don't want to make a statement like Jamie McGregor, but in terms of the question, I'd just like to ask, the, you've mentioned the problems with the old military road and the flooding that's taken place. Has there been any discussion at the task force meetings about resolving the issues of the flooding? I know it's not a permanent solution, but it's just to, if you get the situation where there is a landslip and there's flooding on the old military road, then what action has been taken, apart from the 65-mile uh, detour uh, that people have to take to get into the lodge. Because I remember this petition well uh, the, when we discussed it originally, and there were issues about the economic arguments. It's not just about the transport and the route argument. It's about the economic arguments that I think Jamie McGregor alluded to in terms of the issues for tourism, for local businesses, for the community itself to be able to go about its business freely. But if the alternative route is subject to flooding, then what action has been taken to resolve that? Convener, if, if I may ask, because I know Michael was at the last meeting, if that's okay, just to feed back, Michael, if that's... Yes, they have relayed part of the old military road to um, lower the surface of the old military road, or raise the surface of the old military <laughs> road and improve, lower the surface and improve drainage on it. So they are hopeful it won't recur again, but... You know, sometimes these things happen. There was a particularly dreadful night where there was so much rain that in actual fact it flooded the, the, the alternative route. But I, they're, I, they're reasonably confident it won't happen again. Councillor Kelly. Yeah. The old military road, just for people who don't know, lies directly below the rest to be thankful. So everything that comes in the rest to be thankful, not everything, but most of it ends up in the military road from time to time. So therefore, albeit it is a a uh, bypass road and it's worked uh, in some shape or form, there's still problems with that. I should say that I did travel the road quite frequently when I was a child because my grandmother came from that part of the world, so I, I'm well acquainted with it. Uh, so the, the issue for me is trying to make sure that we do get a permanent solution. And I think the, the last time this petition or summer petition came to committee, the committee was unanimous in its support to allow this to go forward. And we thought at that time there had been agreement with the Scottish Government and the task force to actually take it forward. Uh, but clearly, if the permanent solution hasn't been identified, convener, then clearly we need to put pressure again, not only on the Scottish Government, though, but I think, uh, as we said at the time, there has to be cooperation and joint working with our Gail and Butte Council to ensure that there is whatever solution is worked out is one that's worked out jointly and in cooperation. So the, the, there are issues there, I think, Argyll and Butte Council have to take on board as well, because it can't all just come from the Scottish Government side. Uh, there's got to be cooperation from the Council as well. Don't you convene it, yeah. Are there any further questions? If not, then can I ask the committee to decide what action it wishes to take on the petition? Jackson? Scottish Government and Transport Scotland in the first instance, uh, highlighting the matters that have been raised. I think referring, of course, to the fact that this is a recurring petition. It's one that we had discussed before um, and uh, very much with a view on the back of whatever we hear to potentially considering taking oral evidence at a further, at a further date. I think just for a record then, Jackson, when we're right to the Scottish Government, is it to urge them to look for a permanent solution well, to and, ask them, uh, and I, a cost I, I, associated with that? I think to remind them that we have previously urged that uh, and that uh, our understanding was that there was a consensus around the view that that should happen. I think what we're looking for them is an update on where they think that whole process has now evolved to. Okay. John? This is a follow-up to that, convener, and I agree uh, completely with Jackson in terms of looking to the Scottish Government, but I would, I would also want some type of timeline from the Scottish Government in terms of how, what they're working towards as a permanent solution, and it might also be to... Try and, and I'm not sure uh, the task force uh, meetings have been alluded to in terms of comments made and whether or not the task force could meet more regularly to actually look at the solution to this issue uh, because I am keen that as a, a solution that's come to and arrived at in partnership, not one that's de decided by either Transport Scotland or Argyll and Butte Council. It's got to be something that works for the community, uh, for everybody concerned. And I would look to the Scottish Government to give us some indication of a timeline that they are working towards, rather than just an open-ended uh, permanent solution. Mike? There are three parties to this, essentially. There is the Scottish Government, 
responsibility for the roads through Transport Scotland. There's a Garland Butte Council, which is a key player and is involved in the task force. And there's the wider business community, which is represented on the task force. The Timber Transport Group are represented in the task force. Chambers of Commerce are represented in the task force and a variety of others. I think it would be useful for all three to hear from the committee uh, to, 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 to ask what their views are and what the solution is. And Jackson has a key point. I don't think there is any longer any dispute about the fact that there needs to be additional capital spent on a permanent solution. There is no agreement on what that permanent solution will be. It's a variant of something in this major report, but it could be a combination of two parts of it. And I think the other thing is to urge a, a, an, agree, an early agreement on what that is, because then Donald's point about investment in drawing up those plans, that can go ahead even without capital having been identified. And that is a key point, that there's no capital identified for this. But I think the Scottish Government should be persuaded to spend some money drawing up the detailed plans for the option and identify the capital while they're doing that. And that's what I've argued at the task force. So I think that's a useful step forward. Uh, what uh, Jackson thought. Everybody agreed? Okay. Thank you. Can I thank uh, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Feeland and Councillor McAlpine for attending and uh, we'll now adjourn for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next petition is PE1544 by Olivia Robertson on increasing the maximum sentence uh, for convictions under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006. Members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing uh, and the petition. And may I welcome the petitioner, Olivia Robertson, to the meeting. And uh, I invite Ms Robin to speak to her petition for around perhaps five minutes, after which we will move to questions. Um, good morning. Um, I'd like to firstly begin by illustrating why I started this campaign. Um, I'm sure you'll all be aware of the social media site Facebook. Um, being a user of this site, I've come across a number of disturbing videos of unimaginable animal abuse that has caused me great distress. The issue here that really bothers me about these videos being online is that the people committing these heinous acts are proud of what they're doing. They see it as entertainment and something to show off to others. And I have no doubt in my mind that they see this type of abuse, no, that they're going to carry out this type of abuse to further animals after these videos have been shown. Firstly, under the Animal Health and Welfare Act Scotland 2006, the maximum sentence for dog fighting or causing an animal unnecessary suffering is 12 months imprisonment. Under the same Act, cruel operations, mutilation and administer of poisoning holds a maximum sentence of six months imprisonment. Um, I'd like to draw attention to the logic of this. Putting an animal through cruel operation, mutilation 
and or administering poison, poison to them is still putting an animal through unnecessary suffering. So what purpose does having the sentence serve for applying the suffering in a different way? Um, on the 10th of February of this year, the SSPCA publicly released statistics for sentences handed out by the Scottish courts for animal abuse cases. It has been stated that this has been the highest record number of animal cruelty cases. The article provided that there has been a 66% increase on animal disqualification orders since 2010, rising from 38 to 63, 12 of which have been for life. Fines have totaled to £23,000 and there has been 35 community service orders. However, these numbers barely reflect the, the extent of animal cruelty cases with a total of approximately 78,000 cases intended by inspectors and animal care, animal rescue workers, covering neglect, cruelty and abandonment. Um, one of the most harrowing cases the SSPCA dealt with last year, um, and you might have heard about it, was when a man admitted to taking someone's dog, tying the dog to a tree, covering him in lighter fluid and setting him alight. Um, this man received only a nine-month prison sentence. And I'd like to read out a statement by the Chief Superintendent, Mike Flynn, of the SSPCA, who has said, the number of people banned from owning animals in Scotland is now at a record level, and some of the cruelty we encounter is unimaginable. We rely on the public to be our eyes and ears, and while it is reassuring that so many people are willing to stand up and speak out, the violence and abuse of animals we are dealing with is unacceptable. I have worked for the Society for 28 years, but the cases reported to us continue to shock and disgust me. The incident involved the burned dog in Fife was particularly har harrowing. It is disturbing that anyone could carry out such a barbaric, premeditated act on a, defense, uh, on a defenseless dog. Um, furthermore, to reflect the leniency of causing unnecessary suffering to an animal, um, another article from the SSPCA I read was a man admitting to throwing a cat over his fence after he found the cat to be injured and held in his dog's mouth. He failed to do anything to provide treatment for the cat and caused further injury. After the cat was found over the fence, the cat had been found to suffer hypothermia, shock and nerve damage and later passed away. This man received a £300 fine. Um, Psychological studies have revealed that violence to animals is a, simple, is a symptom of deep mental disturbance. Research in psychology and criminology shows that people who commit acts of cruelty to animals don't stop there and many move on to humans. Um, a statement from Robert K. Ressler of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States, who has developed profiles of serial killers for his work in the FBI, says that murderers very often start out by killing and torturing animals as kids. Um, another psychology research, a survey of psychiatric patients who had repeatedly tortured dogs and cats found that all of them had high levels of aggression towards humans as well. Another study, a New South Wales and Australia newspaper um, a police study in Australia revealed that 100% of sexual homicide offenders examined had a history of animal cruelty. Um, to researchers, a fascination with cruelty to animals is a red flag in the backgrounds of serial killers and rapists. And again, back to the FBI's wrestler, he's described this as, these are the kids who never learned it's wrong to poke out a puppy's eyes. Um, to conclude on this, too often are people convicted under this act perceived as getting away with murder. In today's society, violence towards animals is on par with violence to anyone and it shouldn't be accepted. It has a devastating effect on the family and the community. Um, I actually experienced this firsthand last week when my family cat was aggressively kicked. He actually suffered a broken pelvis and lost function of his bowels and urinary tract and we had to put him down last Wednesday. Um, to put it bluntly, 
My family was absolutely heartbroken, and this was just caused by a stupid, brutal and cruel act. Um, and I'm sure if anything does happen to this person, that he'll just receive a petty sentence, whilst our family cat is gone forever from our lives and we can't bring him back. Um, and I just feel that nobody in our community should have considered this an acceptable thing to do. We are a nation of animal lovers. There are approximately 22 million pets in the UK, and having a pet poses an emotional connection and bond, and losing anyone, whether it be a human or an animal, is difficult. And anyone responsible for this loss of life needs to be appropriately dealt with. The courts need to recognise the seriousness of this offence and recognise the similarities between animals and vulnerable people. Should someone cause suffering to an animal without much thought, what reassurance is there that they won't continue to abuse a child or a vulnerable person who also may not have a voice or be able to defend themselves? Australia has taken the lead with standing up against animal abuse, having raised the sentencing to seven years imprisonment. This has sent an appropriate message that the, the offence is indeed serious, it will not be tolerated and they will be held accountable for their actions. Violence is never acceptable, be it towards a human or an animal, and steps need to be taken to further protect the public from these violence, violent and aggressive people. Um, this campaign isn't just about raising the sentence, it's to prevent animal abuse happening in the first instance. So the steps I would like the Scottish Government to take is to amend the Animal Health and Welfare Act to include a higher sentence to deter the crime and convey the seriousness of the offence, create an automatic lifetime ban for owning animals for convictions under this Act, promote better welfare education, recognise the psychological welfare of animal abusers and take steps to tackle this, and finally, recognise the effect these crimes have the, on the greater community and recognise that animal abusers have the full capacity to continue violence to children, vulnerable, vulnerable people and the general, general public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Robertson, for your presentation. Can I now ask for the committee of any questions? Are you aware whether the, any of the judiciary involved in sentencing or indeed any of the uh, Crown or Procurator Fiscals have ever expressed concern about the inadequacy of the sentencing powers? I'm not sure. I know there has been, there's been other campaigns to try and get this, um, get this increased, but I'm not aware that the Crown have had any, and I suppose if they did, they would have amended it. No other questions? Okay. Can I then ask the committee to decide what action it wishes to take on this petition? Uh, we have a note from the clerks suggesting possible actions. Uh, uh, action? I, I'm quite uh, happy that the petition has been brought before us. It's some time, I think, since we probably have looked at this and at the legislation at the time. There's a useful uh, chart based on a question raised in 2010 that the clerks have submitted. I think it would be helpful to have a uh, to seek to get that brought up to date um, and with that information to ask the Scottish Government for its views on the petition and what in practice it feels has been its operating uh, success. Um, I'm not sure what its views will be in some of the recommendations that have been made, but I think it would be perfectly sensible for this committee to establish what view the Government takes about the success of the legislation it passed uh, and for us to consider it in that light. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Can I support Jackson's uh, call to write to Scottish Government, but when we're looking for figures, could I ask if it's possible to get the Scottish Government to break these figures down into what type of uh, animals were involved in the offence? Because I'm aware that you know, uh, this local farmer not far from where I live was uh, banned from keeping livestock for life because he's cruelty to the livestock he kept, but he can keep horses and ponies. Uh, so, based on the petitioner's comment about if they're causing cruelty to one uh, form of animal, then what's to stop them from uh, translating that into uh, forms of cruelty in terms of uh, the, the other livestock or the 
so it shouldn't call them livestock, the horses and ponies that they keep. Uh, so it's really trying to get the Scottish Government to break that down so that we can actually see whether or not the offences being caused and listed under this are for animal welfare in the wider sense or how that impacts on domestic animals. Because clearly petitioners are concerned about uh, dogs, cats and other domestic animals and the welfare, uh, but some of these offences might actually incorporate much wider uh, offences under the animal welfare legislation. Okay. Well, I think uh, writing to the government would be appropriate. I think we need some clarity in this. I'm certainly not aware of what common law offences you would prosecute under that you might do in, in some other scenarios, uh, and therefore there might be a gap in the law. It would be interesting to know there. It might also be worthwhile asking the S SPCA what they think, because I think there are some issues that still apply to the legislation, not simply in sentencing powers, but on what they can do. I know from speaking personally to Mike Flynn, the difficulties that some come to them in storage of animals pending the outcome of a court case where the animal is not uh, signed over. So I think there are, are broader issues, not simply the actual sentencing powers. And it might be worth hearing from the SSPCA as well as the government as to whether there's perhaps in due course some review, not simply on, on level of penalties, but how the law operates in practice. Okay, then. Uh, can we then agree, then, that we'll write to the Scottish Government asking seeking their views? We'll also ask for a breakdown in the figures. Uh, and we'll also write to the SSPCA. Okay. Can I thank you for uh, your attendance, uh, Ms. Thank Robson? you very much for having me. Okay, thank you. We'll now suspend for a couple of minutes, please. The third new petition today is PE1547 by Ian Gordon and the Salmon and Trout Association Scotland on conserving Scottish wild salmon. Uh, members have a note by the clerk, uh, the updated spice briefing on members' desks and, and the petition. And may I welcome Andrew Graham Stewart, Director, Salmon and Trout Association Scotland to the meeting and I invite you, Mr Graham, to speak to the petition for around five minutes from which we will then move to questions. Good morning and thank you, convener, and thank you to the committee for this opportunity to give evidence this morning in support of, in support of our petition. Um, looking around the room, I think many of you here, like myself, uh, are old enough to remember when salmon were truly abundant. That was back in the 1960s and 1970s. Back then, wild salmon was vi widely available in fishmongers, restaurants, etc. Sadly, that's no longer the case. So what has happened? As most people, I'm sure, will know, young salmon, when they're about six inches long, leave their rivers of origin and migrate to sea each spring. In the 1960s and 70s, for every young, well, sorry, 100 young salmon that migrated to sea, some 25 to 30 would, in due course, after one, two, or three years at sea, return to our coasts. Marine survival, as it's known, was then 25 to 30 per cent. In stark contrast, now marine survival is less than 10 per cent. In the River Bush in Northern Ireland, which is probably the most closely monitored salmon river in the UK, marine survival has fallen to less than 3 per cent in the last two monitored years. What has caused these declines? Changes in the marine environment, pollution, Parasites, particularly parasites from fish farms on the west coast, predators, fisheries, bycatch, and probably most important of all, problems in our um, young salmon finding food whilst they're at sea. The latter point 
is probably due to climate change, and uh, as I'm sure most people will agree, climate change is here to, say, here to say, and despite what Lord Lawson might say, it's not going to be reversed, and it's, uh, if anything, it's likely to get worse, and the impacts uh, that, that it's producing will get worse. The result is, to quote Marine Scotland Science, um, writing in January 2015, quote, the overall strength of the Scottish salmon stock, that's all populations combined, has declined markedly in the last 50 years due to increased mortality at sea. Coinciding with, with this decline has been a great reduction in the coastal salmon netting industry. This has acted as a, quote, buffer, as Marine Science in Scotland science puts it, allowing the number of salmon reaching their rivers of origin to remain reasonably healthy. However, worryingly, we are now seeing significant falls in the numbers reaching key rivers. The River North Esk is very closely monitored by Marine Scotland science. There's a counter on the lower river. Uh, it counts all the returning adult fish as they come in from the sea. The five-year average from 2007 to 2011, uh, in terms of the upstream count, was just over 14,000. The average for the last three years, uh, 2012 to 2014, is 9,300. That is a 35% decline on the previous five-year average. Uh, and I emphasize that this is slightly at odds with the impression given by the briefing prepared by SPICE. We've now had three poor or very poor years in terms of salmon runs. Although the writing has been on the wall, the Scottish Government has been slow to act, react. They've been reluctant to employ the powers they have. However, in the last six months or so, there's been a sea change in their approach, indeed a willingness to address the problems. We welcome this. A year ago, the Scottish Government set up the Wild Fishers Review this reported in September 2014, it tacitly spelt out the problems, recommending that any harvesting must be sustainable and that there should be no exploitation without a licence to kill. At a meeting that I had with a senior civil servant at Marine Scotland in November, he agreed, we do indeed have a problem. There is no longer, I'm pleased to say, a denial of the problem. The Scottish Government is now starting to take some remedial action. Uh, in recent months, they've rushed through a statutory instrument for this uh, season, which has just started. Uh, this is that there should be no killing of any salmon before April the 1st. This is a recognition that the earliest running fish are the most depleted. However, we believe this is somewhat am unambitious on the basis of the 2013 catch figures, the number of salmon killed in Scotland before the end of March was just 200. If the ban on killing salmon was extended to the end of June, that would save 6,500 on the official figures. In our response, that's the Salmon and Trout Association, Scotland's response to the consultation for this measure, we urge ministers to give urgent consideration to introducing another order in time for the 2016 season, that there should be no exploitation or killing of salmon before the 1st of July, and that is what uh, we've now re-emphasised in the petition. Scottish ministers now, are now consulting on a licence to kill system to be brought in for 2016. We support this, but believe it should be allied to a presumption against any, any killing, of, killing of salmon before 1st of July, there is simply no surplus of early running salmon to enable us a, a, a crop to be taken. The second part of our petition uh, addresses the issue of mixed stock fisheries. These are indiscriminate coastal fisheries for salmon uh, which exploit uh, salmon you know, before they reach their rivers of origin. They're indiscriminate because we do not know if a fish being caught are from river stocks where there is a sustainable surplus. At the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organisation in, in June of 2014, I should mention that Scotland is a member of uh, this uh, organisation, NASCO, through its membership of the EU. 
Uh, all salmon producing countries are members of this organisation. It's an important conservation organisation which meets uh, for a week every, every, every summer. At the June 2014 meeting, Scotland was singled out for criticism because of its failure to have developed conservation limits for individual rivers, in line with the NASCO agreement on the adoption of a precautionary approach. Given this failure and the fact that it would take years to address, Scotland should now, if it is to live up to its international obligations, be moving swiftly to end exploitation by mixed-stock fisheries. Regrettably, Scotland is actually moving in the other direction. The net catch increased by 50% in 2013 to, compared to the net catch in 2012. And in the last three years, several netting stations have actually been reopened, having been dormant for several years. This is contrary to the basic cons conservation principles, particularly at a time of declining stocks. In conclusion, our petition, if enacted, will go a long way towards giving vital added protection to our declining wild salmon runs. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I will now throw it open to questions. Angus. Yes, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, uh, Mr Graham Stewart. Um, the, uh, you, you mentioned just in your closing remarks there that the, the net catches had increased uh, significantly uh, in the last uh, year or so. Um, now, there was, of course, a, a voluntary ban on uh, coastal netting uh, of salmon in, in the spring. Um, and as you, as you know, unfortunately, that um, voluntary ban by the netsman uh, has been lifted. Um, with regard to <coughs> um, the coastal, uh, commercial coastal netting, uh, clearly one solution would be for the commercial buyout of um, uh, the operators, the, the, the netsmen. Um, with, with one-off compensation for, for the commercial netters. Um, that obviously would be a, a, a major, have a major impact on, on the numbers of salmon, wild salmon coming through. Um, are you aware of any costings that may have been made uh, with regard to um, um, the buyout of coastal netting stations and, and what the total accumulative cost could be? I think the total accumulated cost would be in the low millions. Um, there's no reluctance on behalf of wild fish interests to uh, enter negotiations with the coastal net netting operators. However, the main coastal netting operators are refusing to negotiate. They, they say they're not going to sell whatever. Uh, so we have a, a, an arm pass, um, and there's nothing one can do if they will not come to the negotiating table. Well, that's clearly something that uh, has to be looked at yeah. uh, closely in the future. But I would emphasise there's absolutely no reluctance on behalf of you know, wild fish con conservation organisations to engage in, in, a, in a, you know, a proper negotiation. Okay. Okay. Any further? Jackson? Uh, it, clearly, this is an area in which you have a considerable specialist expertise, which I certainly don't have. But I was aware when you were talking about percentages and in the 60s and 70s, the supply was bountiful. I said, I, I thought, can you actually quantify it? Uh, I'm interested to know what was the estimated uh, fish population then? What is the estimated fish population now? And, and what do you see the trajectory being just to get some, you know, picture in my own mind of, of, the, of the relative decline? Estimating numbers of a fish that goes thousands of miles out to sea and then returns is obviously not an exact science. No, However, but if we're, if we're able to estimate yeah, a decline in percentage clear, terms, there must no, have an no, idea. There, there, there must have been a population returning to Scotland of perhaps 10 million or so. I mean, I'm, these, these are very rough figures in the 60s and 70s. And I mean, that allowed a very substantial netting catch of, at times, up to half a million salmon a year. Uh, I think it's now clear that the number is possibly as low as a million now. Okay. Thank you. I just that that's quite a, a dramatic Any further uh, picture. Any further questions? Uh, before we make a decision, uh, I would like to point out that we have a note by the clerk suggesting possible courses of action 
Now, since the note by the clerk was written by Spice has updated its briefing to de detail more current action being taken in this area. A Scottish Government consultation is currently running until the end of April, and a further consultation on the draft World Fisheries Bill is due before the end of this parliamentary session. Uh, the Rural Affairs Committee is doing work on the Wild Fisheries Review and is currently taking evidence. So, in these circumstances, I would suggest that the petition is referred to the Rural Affairs Committee now. Do members agree, Angus? Yeah, I would, I would certainly agree with that, Convener, given the, the urgency of the, the, the issue and the fact that the Rural, Rural Affairs Committee is currently uh, taking evidence from the Wild Fisheries Review Group. I think that's um, there in tomorrow. Uh, and then there's um, further evidence to be taken from stakeholders and, and indeed the Environment Minister. Um, I would certainly agree that, uh, we, given the urgency, as I say, we should refer the petition on to the Rural Affairs Committee uh, as soon as possible, um, as it's an opportune <coughs> moment for the, the committee to look at the petition. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Can I thank you, uh, Mr Stewart, for attending? And uh, I will now allow you a few moments uh, to change over. My chairman is actually appearing before the Rural Affairs Committee uh, next week. So. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank Okay. Uh, agenda item uh, three is consideration of current petitions. Uh, the next item of business in consideration of three current petitions. The first current petition is PE1524 by Jane McFarlane on free Wi-Fi in Scottish public buildings. Uh, members have a note by the clerk. Uh, can I invite contributions from members? to be welcoming what the government is doing. There's progress. It did seem to me that we've got a direction of travel. And yeah. Are members also aware that there was a, a, an email come in this morning from the oh. petitioner? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was going to suggest that, given that the petitioner has uh, submitted further information, if we could pass that information on to the Scottish Government and ask them to respond to the issues raised. If that's appropriate. I'm sorry, I've, I've just been advised. I've been a wee slight mistake, and right. uh, so if we can just rewind and uh, <laughs> go back to Kenny. Would you like to start again and by saying that you it would appear that the Scottish government has carried out all its fulfilment? <laughs> and <laughs> well, I, I think there's a direction of travel, and as I say, it did seem to me that the petitioner had. Welcome that. These things can't be done overnight, but there's clearly a plan to roll out Wi-Fi, which is necessary, and we welcome. So, have we agreed then, colleagues, that considering that the Scottish Government has met the terms of the petition, we therefore decide to close the uh, close this petition. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next petition is PE1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax on abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. Uh, members have the note by the clerk. The following evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary at the last meeting, the committee agreed to consider the evidence at this meeting and decide what action to take on this petition. I invite contributions from the members. Jackson. Convener, I thought it was all a bit equivocal uh, at the end of the evidence that we heard last time, and I think we really want to try and get a, a much more specific now um, suggestion timetable that the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, is working towards. And I think it would be useful, not, you know, because I, I welcome the approach that was being articulated, 
but nonetheless, I think there is an urgency and also a desire on the part of the committee to move the thing forward. And the next step, I think, would be on reflection of the evidence given and our reflection of it to say, well, when will we actually, or when does the Cabinet Secretary expect that to coalesce into something a little bit more definitive? Any other contributions? Are we quite happy with that approach that Jackson has mentioned? Okay, then. Thank you. Uh, the third and final current petition today is PE1535 by Alexander Fraser on teaching sustainability and banning, banning plastic bags. Uh, members have the note by the clerk and its submissions. And uh, I invite contributions from members. And I'm also being made aware that this is where the late email came in. And uh, so if you could perhaps... Uh, do you have any contributions from members? I think I welcome the action that's been taken within, you know, education to deal with it. I see where the petitioner's coming from, and I think he's made his point. But I don't think it's for us as a committee to set the precise curriculum for schools and therefore I think there's always got to be some flexibility between raising the issues of the environment and the particular point he makes but not forcing <laughs> forcing more things onto a timetable that's ever constrained uh, and therefore I think there's a limit to what can be done other than as I say make sure that the issue is raised and really leave it to education authorities and teachers to deliver in, in a manner as they see fit. Any other contributions? Jackson? Of that view, I would congratulate the petitioner on having drawn the attention to us, the progress that has actually been made. But I think that um, he himself, uh, in his latest email or, or note to the committee, um, respects the government's uh, advance in all of this. And I think that given that what has been done and the government's attitude to it, we've probably taken the petition as far as we can. And I would be happy to uh, support it being now formally closed. All members agreed? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I will now formally close the meeting. Thank you.